This is The Chris Berry Show. Expert information on wealth, estate, and tax planning for the second half of life. Information that you can understand. Here's your host, Chris Berry. Welcome to The Chris Berry Show. This week, just like every other week, we're going to start with a positive focus. And my positive focus this week is that I got to spend some time in Disney World with my family. So... Uh, we flew out for a, a quick little trip to Disney World. It actually coincided with a work conference that I'm going to spend some time talking about today. Uh, but obviously, if you go to Disney World, that has to be your positive focus. And so we had a great time. We were there just a couple days. Uh, and we spent time at Magic Kingdom. And, of course, we had to ride the uh, uh, It's a Small World After All uh, little ride where i'm gonna sing it for you now and it's gonna be in your head it's a small world after all and once that gets in your head you just can't can't stop thinking about it so i apologize for the singing uh but it was great i spent some time with my wife and my son ryan who's age eight and my daughter madison who's six uh they just had a blast uh we we're only there a couple days but we got a lot in while we were there uh, so the first day, we spent some time at Hollywood Studios, which was great because that's where Star Wars is. And I'm a big Star Wars nerd, so is my son. So we, we got to geek out in some Star Wars, St- Star Wars uh, uh, stuff. Uh, unfortunately, this time, uh, we got to the park a little bit later, so uh, my son wasn't able to uh, fight Darth Vader like he did uh, last time we went. We went about two years ago, and he was able to do the Jedi training against Darth Vader. Uh, but this time, uh, we're a little bit late, so we weren't able to uh, get him in there. Uh, but we were able to... Uh, partake in some of the other Star Wars activities, which was always good. And then we saw that they're going to be building out a whole kind of Star Wars section where they're going to have an immersive uh, experience. Uh, And I think that's going to be in July of 2019 this year. So I'm going to have to start planning my next trip maybe in 2020 to go back there. Maybe I'll take the kids. Uh, I'm not sure because I I want to enjoy the, the Star Wars all for myself. Uh, but it, it was great, and it's kind of interesting. My son has certain things that he likes to do, and my daughter has uh, things that she likes to do. And, and so we had to make some bargains. So while well, my son uh, would, would do a Star Wars thing, the next would have to uh, go attend a, a Frozen show. And it was kind of funny. And I think part of the uh, – my son pretends he doesn't like Frozen, but I think the only reason that he pretends that is because my daughter Madison likes Frozen so much. Uh, because when we were actually at the show, uh, Ryan seemed to be enjoying it more than Madison. Uh, and then on the, on the trip home, we were uh, – uh, flying Delta, we were able to watch movies, and he was watching Frozen. So as much as he pretends to hate Frozen, he apparently is a fan. Uh, but it, it was a great trip, uh, probably one of my favorite uh, parts of it, or favorite uh, shows we actually saw was the Muppets 3D. Uh, and uh, my favorite characters were the, the two old guys that sit up in the rafters and, and do all the heckling. Uh, I forget what their names are right now, but the, they're they're my favorite. And it was a it was a great show. It was pretty funny. And then uh, actually reminded me back, there's a couple of shows that we did where it was more than just watching the show on, on stage or on the screen. It was kind of immersive where, uh, so the Muppets 3D, uh, one of the things is that they would have uh, like a, a vacuum on the screen and they turn on a huge fan and back. And so you could feel like the, the blowing of that or Fonzie squirted a... Um, a flower, one of those squirting kind of magic flowers that squirted it, and then there would be water that would hit your face. And it reminded me back, I think when I was a kid I went, I saw uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and I remember there's a, a scene where there's like rats running around, and they had something kind of whip out underneath the, the seats. So it was, it was pretty cool, and it's just amazing, uh, the Disney World experience, uh, just amazing the amount of detail that they put into everything. Uh, and like I, I started with the show, talked about it, just you can't have a, a sad face when you're at Disney World. Everyone has a smile on their face. Um, but it's just amazing the amount of detail that goes into everything at, at Disney World. It's an amazing experience. Uh, for example, one of the things, uh, I always chew gum when I'm walking around or working out, so I'm a constant gum chewer. And so the last time I was at Disney World, uh, I ran out of uh, chewing gum. And so I went to the gift shop to try to buy some, and lo and behold, they, they didn't sell gum. And I, I asked them, 
there's where's the gum? And they said, well, we don't sell gum, nor do we sell uh, markers, uh, because they don't want to have to clean that up, or they don't have to deal with uh, people writing on things. And uh, the more you get into it, there's a great Disney documentary, but uh, the more you get into it, it's amazing. Even where they place the trash cans, they've actually uh, figured out the time it takes to, uh, from the time you, say, buy a hot dog until you're done with it, uh, that's the number of steps where they're going to have a trash can. And then also one of the things is they're the employees or the cast members, as they call them, they're not, uh, if they were to walk past a piece of garbage that's on the ground, they could be fired right there on the spot. So any cast member, uh, if they see something on the ground, they pick it up. Because it's amazing how clean and, and detailed everything is. So it was just a great experience uh, for the kids, great to spend time with family. They, they really enjoyed it. And then I was actually at a, a work conference there. So that was kind of the, the real reason we were down there. We weren't there just to go to Disney World, but uh, I was at a conference. And what that conference was, was the National Alliance of Attorneys for Alzheimer's Planning. So, and it was the, the first annual conference. So a group of us attorneys uh, basically working together to um, come up with plans or, or best, uh, best case scenarios or best practices for working with individuals and families who uh, have been affected with Alzheimer's. And so what I thought I'd do today is just share my experience of, uh, of the conference uh, and then also get into uh, some legal and financial strategies. So if you do have a loved one that has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, you're equipped with at least the knowledge of the, of the things that you should be looking for. So with this uh, National Alliance of uh, Attorneys for Alzheimer's Planning, there's about 50 attorneys across the nation coming together uh, really to share some of the best practices, share some of the stories, some of the experiences we've had uh, working with our clients, and also just talking about the disease and the effects uh, the disease has, has had. And so it's something that's uh, near and dear uh, to my heart as well as the firm. It's something that we've been involved in for a number of years is uh, the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, for example, we've had uh, Dr. Bruno on uh, a previous episode or a previous show uh, talking about Alzheimer's. So if uh, if you haven't listened to that show, I recommend you go back and listen to it. And you can go to uh, thechrisberryshow.com, and that's Barry, B-E-R-R-Y, uh, uh, to listen to previous episodes. Or if you're on iTunes, you can listen to a previous uh, podcast. But I do recommend that you listen to that Dr. Bruno uh, show. He's really one of the experts as it uh, relates to Alzheimer's and and what's going on from a uh, treatment standpoint. Um, but as a, a firm, we're heavily involved in the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, each year, we're on the committee that helps organize the walk to end Alzheimer's, where last year, uh, the walk that we had, uh, we raised over $178,000, again, $178,000 to go to the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, and that money is used to raise awareness for the disease, uh, as well as to go into things like research, uh, because one of the things that we're trying to do is, uh, within our lifetime, get a cure uh, to the, the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, currently, there is no cure, and that's something that all this research and funding is, is going into. And uh, so it's something that, that's near and dear to our heart of uh, not only my family, but as, uh, also uh, our clients and our, our clients' family. So we've We've been heavily involved in the walk for a number of years, and uh, we continue to be involved. Uh, in fact, uh, we've been uh, talking about the walk for 2019. So pretty soon we're going to start ramping up efforts because usually that's coming up in fall. And so uh, as we get closer, we'll have some more information on that. Um, but so at this, uh, this uh, National Alliance of uh, Attorneys for Alzheimer's Planning, uh, one of the things we're talking about is just the effect it has on families. Uh, both in, in terms of uh, just the, the stress and, and the care needs of the individual as well as the costs. And then also we we're talking about um, the laws as it relates to Alzheimer's. So one of the big things was the BOLD Act passing uh, recently, uh, which is a good thing uh, because it uh, 
raises awareness uh, as well as the additional funding going towards the Alzheimer's uh, and research towards Alzheimer's. Uh, but one of the things that, that we talked about in the workshop was just how do you how do you um, legally and, and financially plan for uh, Alzheimer's or dementia? What are the steps necessary that uh, an individual or family should take to help uh, try to make things as easy as possible because things are going to be difficult moving forward with that Alzheimer's uh, diagnosis. So there's some things from a legal and financial standpoint uh, that you need to think about. And so uh, that's what we're going to, going to cover on in our second segment today is if you do have a loved one that's diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia, what are the legal and financial things that you need to be think about, thinking about? What steps do you need to take uh, to make sure that uh, Given the the cards you're dealt, the cards you're dealt, how can you play that hand the best way possible uh, to make sure that you have the best quality of life possible given a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or a dementia? So that's what we're going to talk about in our second segment today, and then our, in our third segment today, we're going to get into some questions and answers. So some questions that have been submitted uh, either via the phone or uh, via email, and we're going to get into answering those questions. So if you do have a question uh, that, as it relates to legal and financial and, and tax planning, feel free to give us a call anytime at 810-355-2584, or you can shoot us an email at askchris at thechrisberryshow.com, and again, that's Barry with a B, uh, you know, or you can go to the website, thechrisberryshow.com, where there's a, a box where you can submit questions uh, directly there. And we love those questions, so keep those questions coming in because we're all about edu education. And if you want to get your questions answered live, uh, you can feel free to register RSVP for one of our upcoming workshops. So we have workshops about once a week. Uh, we call them clarity building workshops where we get some clarity about the issues that we need to plan for. So we have some coming up in both uh, in February, both in Brighton as well as Livonia. Uh, we have a Brighton workshop uh, coming up Tuesday, February 26th at 2 p.m. Uh, Livonia, we have a workshop coming up Thursday, February 21st at 2 p.m. at our Livonia office. And then in March, we're going to have some workshops coming up in Bloomfield as well as Novi. Uh, at our Novi and Bloomfield Hills locations. And again, we have offices throughout Metro Detroit. Uh, so you can go to our website, thechrisberryshow.com, click through and see a list of our upcoming workshops. Um, so getting back to the, uh, the conference I was at, it was great to see all these attorneys across the nation coming together to try to best kind of share best practices on helping a family as it relates to uh, being diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia because it's something that we're seeing more and more and one of the reasons for that is just the longevity that uh, people have these days where now we're doing a great job of keeping the body going but sometimes it's the mind that's uh, going so given that what are the things that we need to be planning for from a financial and legal standpoint and really, at the end of the day, it breaks into uh, planning ahead. So uh, planning uh, before you get the diagnosis, uh, because uh, there are certain things that you need to think about uh, where, what if I were to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia in the future? Uh, that's a, a possibility for a lot of people these days. So what are the things that prior to that diagnosis, what should you be thinking about as it relates to your long-term care planning? And then the second piece of it is if you have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or uh, dementia, what are the steps that you need to take now? So we break it into kind of two categories, planning ahead, pre-planning, as well as what we call crisis planning. And what we find is that people are, are somewhere along what we call the elder care continuum. And we'll spend some time talking about this in our next segment. Uh, but uh, as a, a group of attorneys, we're talking about these issues of best practices, of 
thinking about things like powers of attorney and if you do have family members taking care of a person with Alzheimer's, setting up care contracts, uh, personal care contracts. Uh, one of the things that we do in our office is we do what's called personal care plans, so having those disability documents in place. And we'll spend some time talking about those disability documents, but the big things that uh, at the very least, we need to have a financial power of attorney and a medical power of attorney and what's called a personal care plan. So those three things, uh, we call those disability documents. So if you were to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia, if you have those disability documents in place, then we can avoid things like guardianships and conservatorships, where now someone has to go to court on your behalf to be able to make these decisions if you were to uh, get to the point where you can't make your own decisions. So um, so as a, a group of attorneys, we were discussing these ideas, uh, sharing best practices, figuring out how are, what are the issues that arise. Uh, and the biggest thing is understanding that we don't just go from healthy to passing away, is that these issues um, kind of create a, a journey for uh, families. And it's a, a similar journey. So if you do have a loved one that has Alzheimer's or dementia, understand you're not alone. Uh, there's a lot of families walking through that, that very situation, that very scenario. And that's something that we've helped uh, countless families is just navigate this long-term care journey. Because a lot of times it's the first time for uh, families going through this process. And in fact, we've had uh, Lauren Kovac on the show. Uh, she's a... Um, she helps uh, with the Alzheimer's Association. She's a volunteer, and she's on the advocacy team uh, for Alzheimer's. Uh, and she was a caregiver along with her mom for her grandma. And one thing she mentioned is that she just felt so alone, but understanding that there was the Alzheimer's Association, that there are other families going through this, uh, it, it really helped her. So, so join us in the next segment as we uh, discuss the legal uh, and financial things that or steps that you need to take uh, if you have a loved one that's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia, as well as talking about the things that prior to that diagnosis, uh, what, what should you be thinking about to make sure that you're putting yourself in the best position possible. So stick with us uh, as we discuss this. The cost of care for an elderly loved one or a loved one with a chronic illness is shockingly expensive. If you are dealing with the unbelievable cost of care, make sure you get all the benefits you're entitled to. Here's certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the Elder Care Firm in Brighton. Most of my clients are, are really concerned about long-term care costs. They don't know where to turn. And what we can do is put together legal strategies to protect your resources and also bring in additional resources to help pay that cost of care. One of the things that they often say is that I, I wish I knew about this years prior. And unfortunately, the information is out there, but there's just so few certified elder law attorneys. As the only certified elder law attorney in Livingston County, it's my job to make sure that our seniors, our loved ones, our veterans have the best quality of care possible and the best quality of life possible. Protect your hard-earned assets from probate, long-term care costs, and the IRS. The elder care firm will get you the government Governmental benefits you deserve, including veterans benefits and Medicaid. Visit the eldercarefirm.com and schedule a free 15-minute phone consultation. That's the eldercarefirm.com. Welcome back to the Chris Berry Show. And now in this segment, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the the legal documents, the fina financial steps that you need to take if you have a loved one that's recently been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. And one of the things uh, that we have as a resource is we have a book that I wrote in 2014 called The Caregiver's Legal Guide to Planning for a Loved One with Chronic Illness. And this is a great guide uh, if you do have a loved one who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia, or even if uh, you don't and you just want to plan for the long-term care journey, uh, this is a great resource guide. And what we'll do for the listeners of the Chris Berry Show this week is for the first five listeners of the show, uh, if you call in or email us uh, with your name and address, what we'll do is we'll send you a free copy of the Caregiver's Legal Guide. So if you want a copy of that, the first five callers, call us at 810-355-2584. Again, 810-355-2584. Or if you want to email us your name and address, 
email us at askchris at thechrisberryshow.com. And that's Barry with a B-E-R-R-Y. And again, if uh, you do want a free copy of that book, just email us uh, or give us a call. And so now what I want to do is is talk about some of the necessary steps, the things that you need to know if you do have a loved one who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. And this will also be good information, even if you don't have a loved one that's uh, been diagnosed, uh, just if you're concerned about planning for the future. So one of the first things that you need to understand is first, where to get advice and understand that there are what's called estate planning attorneys out there. Uh, Estate planning attorneys, uh, they're planning for what happens if you die versus elder law is planning for what happens if you don't die. You continue to age and you face all the issues that go along with aging. So your typical estate planning attorney will talk to you about avoiding probate and trying to understand where your stuff will go upon death. Uh, Versus what we do is we take more of a holistic approach of not just planning for what happens upon death, but also what happens if you don't pass away. If due to the longevity that we're all experiencing, uh, what happens if you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia or any other type of chronic illness, disease, or just the frailties of aging. So this information is good not only if you do have a loved one that's been diagnosed, but also if you're just planning for long-term care. And one of the most important things is understand we see something we call the elder care continuum of uh, if you do have a loved one who's recently been diagnosed, they might be living at home independently, but there's going to come a time where they're going to need some assistance. And that assistance might take the form of home care or maybe a spouse as a caregiver until they suffer from caregiver burnout. Uh, or private duty home care is an option. Uh, And then from there, a lot of times we might need to move into independent or assisted living or assisted living with memory care or even nursing home care. Now, a nursing home these days costs about eight to $12,000 a month in Michigan. Uh, and it's quite a big range, uh, but that's what we see as the going rate these days, is eight to $12,000 a month. And the average stay in a nursing home is about two and a half years. And current statistics say that one in two individuals will need nursing home care, uh, let alone any form of other care. And there was a recent USA Today article that said if you're diagnosed with dementia today, the lifetime cost of that could be over $730,000. So the question is, how do we go about paying for this? And how do we go about planning for this long-term care cost, especially if we have Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis? Well, the first thing you need to understand is there's some basic legal documents that we need to have in place. And the most important documents are what we call the disability documents. So there's three key documents that should be part of your rule book, your estate plan. Because really, that's what an estate plan is. It's uh, creating your own rule book. Because you don't want to rely on the government's rule book. You want to create your own rule book. And that's what an estate plan is, is it's creating your own rule book. And so there's three important, what we call disability documents, that everyone should have. And the first one is what's called a financial power of attorney. And really, when it comes to planning for a loved one who does have an Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis, this is by far the most important document to have because this document sets the stage for uh, what you will be able to do or what you won't be able to do if they were to lose capacity, if they are unable to take care of their own affairs. So this financial power of attorney document, it's very important. And too often when uh, our attorneys review these documents, we find that they're uh, basically just blank checks. They're not specific enough. They're not listing out all of the specific items that you can or cannot do as a power of attorney. Uh, For example, our documents in our office uh, include what we call expanded powers, uh, where we include language that would allow us to set up an asset protection trust or move money around to get qualified for governmental benefits. Uh, But too often, most of the financial powers of attorney documents I review are only like two to five pages with maybe a blue back piece of paper. They're missing all of that language because if you were to try to take one of those two to five page financial powers of attorney into a bank to try to get anything done, they're going to run it through their legal department. And most likely they're going to say that, no, it's not specifically listing what you try to do. So 
Our powers of attorney in our office typically are about 20 pages. And it's not because we like killing trees or we're paid by the word. It's that we found that we need to include all of this very specific language in the document. Uh, so this is very important if you do have a loved one that's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. Uh, and it's very important if you're planning ahead. If uh, maybe you're recently retired and long-term care costs are, are not something you're experiencing now and you hope not to, but you're concerned about the future. Having a, a well-drafted financial financial power of attorney is really the difference between a family being able to do everything they need to for their loved one versus a family having to go to court because uh, the document doesn't specifically list what needs to be done. So then in addition to the financial power of attorney, the second key disability document is what's called a medical power of attorney. Or in Michigan, we call this a patient advocate designation. And this is a document that appoints someone to make medical decisions uh, for an individual, <clears throat> including the ability to re be removed from life support. So if you remember Terry Schiavo, she was a woman down in Florida. She was in a vegetative state. Uh, her husband wanted to remove her from life support, and her family wanted her to remain on life support. And it ended up being a court battle that lasted over eight years. Well, all of that could have been avoided had Terry Schiavo had a clear medical power of attorney uh, d appointing either her husband or her family as the person to be able to make medical decisions. And then in that medical power of attorney, she could have included language uh, with regards to her end-of-life decision-making, whether she wanted to remain on life support or if she uh, wanted to give them the ability to remove her from life support. Now, that has to be in writing. So that's where that medical power of attorney comes into play, which is the second key disability document. And then the third key disability document is what's called a personal care plan. And a personal care plan is a document that gives instructions to the financial and medical power of attorney on how best to uh, care for an uh, uh, individual if they were to need long-term care. So just like your medical power of attorney gives instructions on how to make decisions with regards to end of life, this is where the personal care plan comes into play. And it's the document that gives instructions to your financial and medical power of attorney, to your caregivers, on how best to care for you if you were to need long-term care. For example, do you want to be kept at home as long as possible? Uh, do you want to visit family? Visit family only on special occasions? Do you want to attend religious services? Uh, what are the hobbies that you like to participate in? Books you like to read? Television shows you like to watch? Might seem obvious, but it's important to get these things in writing so that if you were to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia or just the frailties of aging, this is a handy guide that we could give to our financial and medical power of attorney on how best to care for us. Or it's a document we could give to our caregivers if we were to have uh, caregivers coming into the home. Or we could give it to our uh, assisted living community. Uh, because these habits, these are the things that, that make up who we are. So we think it's important to document those. So with those three disability documents, the financial power of attorney, the medical power of attorney, and that personal care plan, you've really set the legal foundation on how to care and plan for a loved one uh, who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. And, and even if we're not in that situation, those three key disability documents are really important for anyone uh, who's around retirement age, uh, either just before retirement or after retirement, uh, because uh, you never know when life's going to throw you a curveball. So it's important to have these things in place. For example, Terry Schiavo, she was actually in her mid-30s. So... Uh, Basically, anyone over the age 18 should have that financial and medical power of attorney. Now, in addition to those disability documents, uh, it's also important to plan for uh, how are we going to pay for long-term care. So the important things that we need to understand is, is that the costs for long-term care are going up. And the way the system is set up, the more resources you have, uh, the more resources you can bring in, the better quality of life. And that's what's important is when we do receive a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia, it's important to uh, ensure that uh, we make sure that they have the best quality of life possible as they go through this diagnosis, as they go through the elder care journey. And that's where we want to make sure that we're bringing in uh, as many resources as possible uh, and protecting the resources as much as possible. So we need to figure out how are we going to pay for this long-term care journey. And so 
uh, once we understand the costs and understand a nursing home can run eight to twelve thousand dollars a month then we need to understand how are we going to pay for this and even if we don't need nursing home care how are we going to pay for assisted living how are we going to pay for home care and really we only have two approaches at the end of the day we can either pre-plan so plan ahead and we'll talk about some strategies there or we can rely on crisis planning just relying on when we get to that point what can we do and now if we do plan ahead so the earlier we start planning for this the more options we're going to have on, a, on the table uh, for example one of the strategies would be to set up an asset protection trust uh, a trust uh, called a castle trust and what the castle trust is is a type of trust that can avoid probate control the distribution upon death but then also it builds in asset protection where we can protect against uh, nursing home costs or that Medicaid spend down. And now Medicaid is a governmental program that will pay for your nursing home care. But to qualify for Medicaid, a single individual can only have $2,000 worth of countable assets. A married couple, they make you cut your assets in half. At most, you can keep $120,000. And then Medicaid looks back five years to see if you've made any gifts. And if you have, they're going to look at penalizing you. <clears throat> so what the Castle Trust can do is move you can move your assets into the castle trust you can still serve as trustee you can manage the assets you can receive the income from the trust uh, but as soon as we move those assets into the trust what it does is it starts the five-year clock ticking for medicaid or nursing home spend down and what that means is that if we can make it five years from the time we move the assets into the trust then everything inside of the trust would be protected from that nursing home or medicaid spend down so what that means is we could have medicaid pay that base level of care and then we'd have a pot of resources available to pay for additional services to improve the individual's quality of life or if we have a married couple where one spouse needs long-term care that healthy spouse isn't completely impoverished having to pay for that care because the question is would you rather spend the money or would you rather the money go to the government or to nursing homes and most people would rather spend their own money so that's what the castle trust does it gives you the freedom uh, to protect these assets from that nursing home or Medicaid spend down. <clears throat> and then another option with regards to planning ahead uh, would be looking at uh, forms of long-term care insurance such as asset-based long-term care uh, which is very different than the old pure traditional long-term care insurance the problems with traditional long-term care insurance would be that they hike up the premiums on you all the time and then if you pass away peacefully without using that policy all that money that you've spent in that policy is gone that's where asset-based long-term care is an answer to those two problems for example let's say you have five hundred thousand dollars inside of your IRA what you could do is you could move a hundred thousand dollars of that using what's called the Pension Protection Act into a new IRA and that new IRA could be leveraged to offer you a two hundred thousand dollar long-term care benefit uh, or if you were to pass away peacefully in your sleep without utilizing that policy it could be a two hundred thousand dollar death benefit to your beneficiaries so again that's just a form of asset-based long-term care that fits into those uh, pre-planning strategies as it relates to planning for long-term care, uh, planning for a loved one that has dementia or Alzheimer's. And if you want some more information on uh, some of these planning strategies, including some of the crisis planning strategies, where even if you have a loved one in a nursing home now, uh, there's certain things that we can do to try to protect those assets for the benefit of the individual or the family. If you do want some more information, uh, then we have a couple options for you. So the first option is for the first five people, who call in or email us, we'll send you out a free copy of our book, The Caregiver's Legal Guide to Planning for a Loved One with Chronic Illness. Now, you can also get it on Amazon for about $15 if you want to find it there, but for the first five callers, we'll send out a free copy. So if you call us or email us, phone number is 810-355-2584. Make sure to leave your name and address and that you're request, requesting a book. We'll get a copy out to you. Or shoot us an email at askchris at the chrisberryshow.com and again that's Barry with the E as in Edward in there not A uh, so for the first five callers uh, or emails 
They come in, I will send you out a free copy of that book. Another option is you can attend one of our free Clarity Builder workshops. Uh, these are free legal, financial, and tax workshops. And we have them about once a week at one of our different locations. So uh, we have some coming up uh, in Livonia, and as well as Brighton in February. And then in March, we're going to be in Novi, Bloomfield Hills. And, and stick with us in our third segment. If you or a loved one is facing long-term care costs, make sure you talk with certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the Elder Care Firm, like Jennifer did from Howell. This past summer, my mom had to transition into a nursing home. So we contacted Chris to help get things in order. You know, I wanted the best. I wanted somebody who knew what they were doing. Chris was able to help save a lot of that money that my mom and dad both worked so hard for. I thought that everything would have to go to the nursing home, but it didn't. He was able to save us half of everything that would have gone if we hadn't contacted the elder care firm. Uh, And we're all happy about that. Don't go to the nursing home without contacting Chris first. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. The elder care firm is here to help you and your family find solutions. Call us today. Protect your assets from probate, long-term care costs, the IRS, and get the governmental benefits you deserve. Visit TheElderCareFirm.com today or call 810-214-3800. 810-214-3800. Welcome back. As we're wrapping up the last segment, we were talking about... Uh, legal and financial planning for a loved one with who's been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's and we're talking about some resources available and one of those resources is a copy of the book we wrote in 2015 called the caregiver's legal guide to planning for loved one with chronic illness which actually was a, a top 10 in the elder law category on Amazon for a couple of years pretty proud of that so for the first five callers call us at 810-355-2584 or email us at askchris at com. we'll get you a copy of uh, that book. All you need to do is make sure to leave your name and address for us. Uh, if you don't leave your name and address, how can we get you the book? Uh, and then also another uh, resource or option, if you want to learn more about planning for a loved one with Alzheimer's dementia, or if you just want to learn about planning ahead, planning for yourself, planning for what to do for your second second and a half of life, uh, then you can attend one of our Clarity Builder workshops. We call them Clarity Builder workshops because uh, even though a lot of times you might be walking away from the workshop with some questions, a lot of times people tell me that they have some clarity around the issues. Uh, So if you do want more information on one of our Clarity Builder workshops that are free, you do have to register and space is limited. Uh, I know we have one next week that's already full, uh, but we have some coming up in Brighton, Livonia, Novi, and Bloomfield Hills in the next month or so. Uh, Give us a call at 810-355-2584 and we can get you out a list of our upcoming workshops. Or if you go to our website, thechrisberryshow.com, and that's Barry with an E, uh, you can click through and see a list and register for one of our upcoming workshops online. Uh, or just email us at askchris at thechrisberryshow.com, and we can send you a list of our upcoming workshops that way as well. Uh, and these workshops, great information. Uh, it's, uh, it's free. It's educational. Uh, we're not selling anything. Uh, because we like to make sure that all of our clients uh, and, and the public are well informed. I think it's something that I picked up from my dad. My dad was a teacher and professor at uh, Oakland Community College for 40, 47 years. So I think I caught that teaching bug from him. So we like to do these workshops. Uh, we take a very educational approach. That's why we are doing this radio show. Uh, that's why I wrote the book, The Caregiver's Legal Guide to Planning for Loved One with Chronic Illness. Uh, that's why we do the workshops. So again, if you want more information on that, feel free to visit our website, thechrisberryshow.com. Now this segment, i uh, going to get into some questions and answers, but before I do that, I just want to wrap up uh, the discussion with regards to planning for long-term care, especially if you have a loved one that's diagnosed with Alzheimer's and or dementia. And so we talked about pre-planning strategies, looking at things like a castle trust, which is an asset protection trust where we can protect our assets. Then also we have uh, the option of what's called asset-based long-term care, which is one of those uh, one of those uh, 
new uh, ways to plan for long-term care versus the traditional pure old long-term care insurance of the past. Uh, so a lot of times when I say the word long-term care insurance, people can, oh, no, not that. Uh, but th- when, when they understand how asset-based long-term care works, they're like, wow, how does this, this is magical. This, is, this makes a lot of sense. And this is one of those things that we talk about uh, in our Clarity Builder workshops. Then also, in addition to these pre-planning strategies, we also have what we call crisis strategies, where if you have a loved one who is paying for long-term care now, whether it's home care, assisted living, or nursing home care, understand we don't have as many options, but there's still things we can do. For example, if you have a loved one in a nursing home right now, one of the things that we can do is we can uh, we can uh, look at a crisis planning strategy. For example, we can do what's called a half loaf plan, where instead of spending down to that two thousand dollar asset limit that Medicaid requires, one of the things we can do is what's called a half loaf plan, like a loaf of bread. Where uh, think of it like a loaf of bread, where half the money would have to go to the nursing home, but the other half could be protected and could be used to pay for additional services uh, to improve the quality of life of the individual. Needs. Care, So it's complicated, but understand there are things we can do as it relates to planning for long-term care, even if you have a loved one in a long-term care situation now. So understand there's things we can do to plan ahead, and we have more options that way, and there's things we can do even if we haven't planned ahead and we're in a crisis now. But the important thing is to understand your options and get educated on your options. Uh, And that's where our Clarity Builder workshops make a lot of sense uh, because understand there's different levels of knowledge out there. For example, I I recently had someone attend one of our Clarity Building workshops. They were invited by a family member. And they recently sat down with an attorney, a state planning attorney, and they they recently kind of finished up the financial plan for mom. Uh, But... uh, the person they're sitting down with really wasn't equipped to deal with the long-term care issues. Uh, they weren't a member of the National Alliance of Attorneys for Alzheimer's Planning. They weren't an elder law attorney. They weren't a certified elder law attorney. Uh, they weren't a, a, a fiduciary. So they just didn't really have the level of knowledge necessary. And unfortunately, they just paid this attorney. Uh, they did their plan in, in uh, just a couple months ago, and they attended the workshop because they saw the that we were talking about long-term care costs and their friend referred them. And they attended the workshop and we sat down after the workshop for what we call a vision conversation where we figure out where uh, the individual is at in terms of their planning and then we figure out where they want to go and if there is a gap there, we talk about options to close the gap. And unfortunately, when they sat down, they brought in this this uh, estate plan that was done just a couple months ago, but it didn't take into account any of the things that we've talked about today. Uh, They were missing a personal care plan. Uh, The financial power of attorney wasn't drafted to uh, allow the movement of assets to protect those assets from long-term care. Uh, They had just a basic revocable trust that avoided probate and uh, controlled the distribution upon death. But at this point, mom uh, was recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and they were more concerned about making sure mom's money lasted as long as mom did. And so even though they just sat down with an attorney a couple months ago, we had to basically rework the whole plan uh, for these issues that we've talked about on the show. We had to make sure that she had the right disability documents in place, that she had a financial power of attorney that included those expanded powers. We had to move the assets from that revocable trust to put them into the castle trust to try to protect those resources so if mom did progress to need nursing home care that her money was uh, protected uh, so that she could be protected from that nursing home or Medicaid spend down to make sure that mom's money lasted as long as mom did. So that plan that she put together with that other attorney was basically useless at the end of the day because their real goal was to make sure that mom's money lasted as long as as her, as she did, uh, they were less concerned about where the money went upon mom's death. And they were frustrated that they sat down with this person uh, and, and they just didn't address the, the legal issues. And it's frustrating for me understanding that people are getting not necessarily the best advice because people, unfortunately, uh, attorneys, they're, they're not all at the same level. Financial planners, they're not all at, have the same level of knowledge. And as it relates to planning for the second half of life, that really is our, our niche. We're trying to make sure that your money lasts as long as you do. 
protecting your money from the threats that could throw that plan off, whether it's long-term care costs uh, due to Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis, uh, whether it's market volatility, making sure that the risk of your investments uh, match your volatility, whether, whether it's longevity risk, whether it's uh, tax planning, making sure that your money is protected and, and you're not paying unnecessary taxes. Uh, for example, uh, look at your portfolio. Do you have uh, 401ks or IRAs, uh, pre-tax money? If you do, then now is the time, just based on the way the tax code is written, to look at maybe moving money from those tax-deferred accounts to pay the tax sooner rather than later. Because if you do nothing, come 2025, let alone what happens in 2020, taxes are going to go back up. So it makes sense to pay the taxes sooner rather than later in a lot of situations. And if your professionals aren't talking to you about these things, protecting against long-term care costs, protecting uh, against paying unnecessary taxes, uh, then maybe you should get a second opinion and get some more advice. And, and that's really where a Clarity Builder workshop comes into play, uh, where we discuss these different threats. And unfortunately, uh, not enough professionals are talking about these things, which really, with what we call the longevity risk, of the fact that people are living longer than ever, it makes it even more important to make sure that your money lasts as long as you do. And again, with, with that situation of that client who sat down with a professional a couple months ago, that plan was all about where was the money going to go when mom dies. What was more important is, well, what happens if mom doesn't die, she continues to live? How are we going to make sure that mom's money lasts as long as she does? Because we want to make sure mom has the best quality of life possible before worrying about anything going down to the kids. And again, if, if you want more information on this, then uh, give us a call or attend one of our free Clarity Building workshops. Now, uh, with that said, let's get into some of our questions from our listeners. And again, if you do have questions, you can call us anytime at 810-355-2584, or you can email us at askchris at com, And that's Barry with the E. So the first question is from Jake. And Jake uh, says, I'm 62 years old. I'm planning on retiring at age 70 and collecting Social Security at that time, which I think is a, a great idea to let that Social Security grow. Uh, my equity allocation is under 20%. I'm planning on adding uh, with the dollar cost averaging 10 to $12,000 per year for the next eight years uh, in the following. Uh, some growth funds, international funds, uh, stock market, and balance funds. I have three years worth of living expenses in cash. Uh, this would bring my allocation up to 25% equities. Is this a good plan to meet long-term growth goals for retirement? Well, Jake, there's a lot that goes into it. One of the things that we recommend in situations like this is to look at what we call the bucket plan. So the idea here is that you allocate your dollars in three different buckets. So the first bucket would be what we call our now bucket. And the now bucket is going to be money that we think should be used, uh, uh, you cover your expenses for the year. So if you do have an income gap from uh, your Social Security or, or pension, and it sounds like uh, you're not going to take your Social Security right away, so you're going to have to cover your expenses. Well, that should be in your now bucket for the for one year. Looks like you have three years worth of living expenses uh, sitting maybe a little more safe than it needs to be. So typically, what we recommend is to have one year's worth of income needs or living expenses sitting uh, safe and liquid, like cash, uh, savings, uh, money market. And then also in that now bucket, make sure to have any expenses. For example, if you need to have a new roof or any uh, kitchen remodel, that should be in your now bucket. And then also any, uh, any trips, any planned expenses. Uh, maybe you're planning on taking a trip to Hawaii or something like that. That should be in the now bucket, plus whatever your emergency fund is, uh, money sitting around. So if there's some type of emergency, you feel comfortable, whether it's 20000 50000 whatever that number is. So that should be in your now bucket. Then what I would suggest is that you calculate what is going to be your next 10 years worth of income needs and add an inflation hedge. <clears throat> and that would be what's called the soon bucket. So what, uh, or maybe not 10 years, uh, if you're 62 right now, maybe looking at uh, kind of your first phase of retirement and your second phase of your retirement. So the first phase might be from 62 to 70 when you turn on Social Security. So you're going to have an income gap in there. And so I would make sure that that money is kind of invested uh, safer, uh, maybe more conservatively uh, than the later bucket. So the later bucket would be money that you're most likely not going to need to touch over the next 8 to 10, 12 years. And with that, you can invest that money typically a little bit more 
uh, aggressively because you have a time horizon with that soon bucket. That soon bucket is buying you a time horizon. So a lot of times that later bucket might be invested more aggressively in the market, while that soon bucket we want probably more conservative. And everyone's a little bit different. So one of the things we do with our clients is we run them through what we call a volatility tolerance, figure out how much risk they're really willing to take on in their soon bucket as well as their later buckets. So, Jake, hopefully that was helpful. I, I can't give you any specific advice without sitting down with you uh, to do that volatility tolerance. But again, I would point to that bucket plan concept of having your now bucket being about one year's worth of income, your soon bucket being your next 8 to 10, 12 years worth of income needs, uh, plus an inflation hedge in there. Uh, and then your later bucket would be your money invested for growth as well as uh uh, long-term care needs, uh, as well as a legacy, uh, not just for maybe the kids or next generation, but also, especially if you're married, make sure that that surviving spouse is taken care of. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful, Jake. Now, uh, the next question, this is from Tim. So my dad died. He had no other assets other than a life insurance policy for uh, about $10,000. He had a will naming all three kids as beneficiaries, the question is, does the life insurance go to the youngest brother who is named as a beneficiary of the life insurance, or does the will control where the assets go? Well, Tim, this gets into understanding how estate administration works. How do assets pass out of your name upon death? And really, there's only four ways that assets can transfer out of a deceased individual's name. And the first option is with joint ownership. So if you're joint on a checking account, uh, let's say husband and wife, husband passes away joint on a checking account, leaving it to the spouse, uh, then it goes to the spouse. Second would be through a beneficiary designation. So a life insurance policy naming a beneficiary goes to whoever the name beneficiary is. Third would be through a trust, and there's no trust in this situation. But if an asset doesn't pass through joint ownership, beneficiary designation trust, then it ends up going into probing. And that's what most people want to avoid because it's a court process, it's time consuming, and it's costly. Now, the good news in this situation is that the life insurance policy, because there is a beneficiary, does avoid probate. But the bad news is that the will that's in place, all a will does is gives instructions to the probate court on how to administer an estate. So if, if an asset doesn't end up going into probate, then the will does not control anything. So in this situation, if there's only one brother named as a beneficiary of that life insurance policy, then that life insurance policy, regardless of what the will says, ends up going to the named beneficiary. And really, the only way to fight that would be to go to court. So um, understand beneficiary designations do control uh, if there is a will and the asset doesn't end up going into probate. So again, thank you for the questions this week. Uh, and I appreciate that. If you do have a loved one that's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, give us a call. We have some resources available, whether it's our workshops or we can get out a free copy of the Caregiver's Legal Guide Planning for Loved One with Chronic Illness. Uh, thank you and make it a great week. Take care. Learn more about Chris Berry and how he can help your family by visiting online at thechrisberryshow.com. That's thechrisberryshow.com. You can also call Chris Berry at 810-355-2584. That's 810-355-2584. This program content reflects the opinions of Chris Berry and his guests, not the elder care firm, Prosperity Capital Advisors, or the C.J. Berry Group, and is subject to change at any time without notice. Content provided herein is for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as investment or legal advice or a recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of any security or to follow any legal or tax strategy. There's no guarantee that the strategist's statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses which would reduce returns. All investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There is no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. We recommend that you consult with a professional dedicated to your needs. This program is furnished by the Elder Care Firm.